Well, good evening. We're going to attempt um, Lord's Day 26. This is take two. Um, had COVID last week. It was basically cold symptoms. So I have a tickle in my throat and got halfway through. Couldn't finish. So we'll, we'll try again. Um, have you ever been pursued or chased by someone who was desperate? And we're on Lord's Day 26, by the way, if I didn't say that already, and we're going to be talking about baptism. Well, thinking about being pursued by someone who's desperate, I knew a man one time who was pursued by a desperate woman, and she had all kinds of dreams and goals that he did not share. Um, she would call very often. Uh, this was before the days of caller ID. She came up, became unannounced and tried to do housework at his house. Um, one day he called her mother. Her mother was embarrassed and came and had her removed from the property. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be loved, but only by, only by the people whom you want to love you. Usually the only person flattered by a desperate lover is another desperate person. That's a sure recipe for disaster. However, our, our, our hearts do long for fulfillment, for someone to love us, to take an interest in us, to share life with us, to count our words important enough to listen to, <clears throat> excuse me, in our dreams, exciting enough to, for them to join us in them. When you're loved, you feel validated. So, I guess you could say, in some sense, there's a desperate side to each of us. We long to be accepted. We long to be respected. We long to be able to share our lives with someone and not be rejected. And the more attractive the other person is, the better we feel about ourselves. And I'm not just talking physically attractive. It could be uh, the person's intellect or humor or character. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but... Um, physical attraction is the most superficial, so we'll, it's the easiest perhaps to deal with. We'll, we'll use that and we'll think about maybe a commercial or a movie that you can call to mind where some geeky scientist type kid uh, is pursued by a model looking female. You think, what would they have in common? Does she want to, does she want to discuss you know, quantum physics with him. Um, well, maybe she. There's some things she finds beautiful. Maybe she. Maybe she's tired of guys who are jerks, and she feels that he's beautiful because of his potential loyalty. Or maybe she likes his earning possibility. Imagine the most beautiful person in the world being attracted to you. How exciting it would be to be with that person and how thrilled you'd be and amazed that they love everything about you. Perhaps you're blessed to have someone who shares your dreams and is a great encouragement to you and takes very good care of you and love. Well, not taking anything away from your spouse or whoever you have in mind, but being loved by a holy God is far more thrilling that he would come down to our level and that he would, he would bind us to himself and that he would uh, make us holy so that he can take delight in us. Has this truth ever sunk in, that the Holy God has taken you to be his own? Are you ready to open your life up to him? Are, are you ready to discover him as he opens himself to you through the scriptures and the person of Jesus Christ? Are you ready to be known, to share your deepest and most intimate thoughts and desires with him? Are you willing to let him love you? Will he accept you? Will he put up with you? Will he stick with you? Will he be ashamed of you? Will he laugh at you? Or, as I said, will he make you holy and take delight in you? There's an element of surprise in God's love that he would love you so much that Jesus would absorb an eternity worth of punishment that you deserved 
And he would do that so that you could live. He doesn't scoff at our sins. He leads us out of them. He does not make fun of our ideas. He refines them. He doesn't look down on our offer to love him. But he gives us grace so that we actually can. He listens when we talk to him. He is with us in trials and temptations and celebrations and birth and death and everything in between. He's leading us safely home so that he can share himself with us. Baptism helps this truth to sink in. Baptism is far more, <coughs> excuse me, is far more than you making a profession of faith. That's an element in it. But it's more about God making a public promise to you. It's more about God proclaiming his work in your life, how he loves you and how far he is willing to go in his commitment to love you. If you are one of his, a believer, a follower of Christ. So let me read uh, question 69 of the Heidelberg Catechism. How does holy baptism signify and seal to you that the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross benefits you? And here is the answer. In this way, Christ instituted this outward washing, and with it gave the promise that, as surely as water washes away the dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and spirit wash away the impurity of my soul, that is, all my sin. Christ's devotion in giving his life for you was quite personal. He knew your sins before you committed them, and he still chose you. He did not die for a group of nameless, faceless people. He knew exactly for whom he was dying. The Bible says that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Baptism can be thought of in terms of a wedding ring or a wedding photo. I like a, a wedding photo that we have framed of Nancy and me walking down the center aisle of the church where we were married, smiling, looking out at our friends and family who were there. Um, it's a nice reminder of the fact that God brought us together and the life that we share together. Even though baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime event, whenever you see baptism, it should rekindle in your mind thoughts and memories <clears throat> Excuse me. of how you came to Christ, whether you grew up in a Christian home or met Jesus later in life. The point is, he came and found you, and he knew you. And he knew everything about you. He sent his spirit to convict you of your sins because of his love for you. When he died on the cross, he purchased you so that he could take custody of you, guaranteeing then that you would be granted faith to believe and you would come to hear the gospel. <clears throat> Excuse me. His death was your death. His resurrection was your resurrection. You were made alive in him so that you could believe and reach out to him. He didn't choose you because you were good. And so if he didn't choose you because you were good, you weren't good, then he won't abandon you on days when you're not good. Um, he will patiently work to change your affections and your thoughts and your actions so that you might love him properly in response. He reveals to you his astounding glory so that you might love him and not settle for the cheap imitations that this world offers, which cannot satisfy our souls. <clears throat> Excuse me. Christ instituted an outward washing, which is called baptism, to remind us of his work, of his love for us. When you witness, or if you have not yet been baptized, when you come to be baptized, you're witnessing a pledge that as surely as water washes away dirt, so the blood of Christ removes our sins. We can't see our sins as a physical entity. We don't actually take a bath in blood. There are plenty of invisible things that you participate in. You and your children or your parents, you can say that there is love, a bond of love that exists between you, but you can't see it. Now, you can see signs of it, like a hug or a card or kind words. Those are more tangible things. Christ showed his love for us by giving his life. 
so that we might live. His blood was shed on the cross as a ransom price to satisfy the Father's justice. It's as if believers have been washed in Christ's blood. I believe I can identify a time when I was the dirtiest in my life. It was a time when I was helping my dad tear out a chimney at my brother's house. It was a chimney that had been tied to a coal furnace that no longer existed. But I don't think that that chimney had been cleaned out in many years. There was a lot of, we we didn't realize how much coal dust was in there. (coughs) Excuse me. And it made a tremendous mess. And we could stand and laugh at each other when we were done because we were completely filthy. But it was nothing that water and a little bit of soap didn't handle. It took care of everything. Well, no matter how filthy we are with our sins, no matter how polluted, the blood of Christ is a powerful cleansing agent that can completely remove the stain. So no sin is too deep or too ugly or too stubborn for the power of Christ's sacrifice to remove from us. And his spirit is the agent which acts on us to apply the benefits of his death. Let me move on to question 70. Question 70. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? And the answer... To be washed with Christ's blood means to receive forgiveness of sins from God through grace because of Christ's blood poured out for us in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with his spirit means to be renewed by the Holy Spirit and sanctified to be members of Christ so that more and more we become dead to sin and lead a holy and blameless life. Washing is a sign of God's love that refers then to forgiveness of sins Um, and by his spirit being made a member of Christ, a a partaker of his nature, uh, of his body, that we might live a new and eternal quality of life. Titus 3 talks about it as the washing of rebirth. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or did you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. (coughs) Excuse me. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Water baptism is important because of what it signifies. If you love your spouse, God's plan is that you formally express that love with a marriage covenant, and you can use a ring as a sign of that covenant commitment. So God wants us to formally accept his love by being baptized. Um, This signifies a real mystical participation in Christ. Basil of Caesarea, who was one of the church fathers in the fourth century, he pictured baptism also as far as the effect it has on us as rounding a post in a foot race. Think of barrel racing at a rodeo. The horses are sprinting till they get to the barrel, then they have to stop and turn around, make a sharp U-turn, and go back the opposite direction. When we come to Christ, when we are washed by his blood, there is to be a noticeable effect. We are to reverse direction. Instead of loving ourselves or some idol, an idol is anything less than God that we look to in the place of God for satisfaction. If we love ourselves or we love an idol, then we are not giving God our true love. Just as when you got married, you stopped dating other people. So when you receive the sign of baptism, you stop courting other gods. Basil pictured the water of baptism as a figure of death in which the old nature dies and no longer actively produces acts leading to death. Instead, we partake of the very nature of Christ and begin producing acts which lead to life. Everything that separated us from God dies. We can't consider that picture and say, oh, 
okay, God's love for us is uh, him d- doing away with our will and imposing his will on us. Well, in a sense, yes, it is. It, that is eternal life for us to give up our self-will and to surrender to his holy will. And he gives us the grace to do that. Ezekiel chapter 36 talks about God giving us a new heart so that we will pursue him in holiness. Lastly, (coughs) excuse me, question 71. Thank you for putting up with my sips of water and dealing with the tickle in my throat. Where has Christ promised that he will wash us with his blood and spirit as surely as we are washed with the water of baptism? Answer, in the institution of baptism where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. This promise is repeated where scripture calls baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. In scripture, the uh, sacrament of baptism and the reality that it, that it uh, pictures is so closely put together that sometimes it's spoken of interchangeably. Listen to Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Also, Acts twenty two sixteen. And now, why are you awaiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The significance of washing, either by submersion or by sprinkling, was a part of the true religion of the people of God in the Old Testament. If you were to read in Hebrews 9, you would see there... It speaks of Moses sprinkling blood on the the tabernacle and the implements in the tabernacle. It was an indication that everything needed to be cleansed by blood. Salvation is by faith, not by works. So you might say, well, I'm not actually saved by baptism. No, that's true. That's correct. You're not saved by Christ. That could lead some people to make the error of saying, so baptism really isn't important. As long as I believe, then I don't have to be baptized. Well, it is important to God because he commands it in Matthew 28. God wants his love to be known and to be returned formally and informally, not one or the other. Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, What should our response be? to someone who has made such a sacrifice to shed his blood so that our sins could be removed. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should seek to grow as a lover, to learn of him, spend time, with him and learn how to let ourselves be loved, our goal should be to become holy as he is holy. Were it anyone else but God, you could rightly say that this is too good to be true. But yet God's love is a part, it's who he is. You can confess to him your deepest, darkest secrets And he will not run away from you. He will not laugh. When you're rejected or overlooked by others or feel lonely, he will never join your enemies against you. He will never forsake you. When you want to do right and yet you feel sort of embarrassed or pressured by the world, he will be your friend to help you to do what is right. 
When you're confused, he will be your counselor. When you are embarrassed, his love will enable you to face the world and carry on. When the world tells you you aren't good enough in some way, he promises to make you good enough through the merit of Christ to be made holy and to enter heaven and enjoy him for eternity. When you fail, he picks up the pieces with you and he always knows the way forward. When you suffer such loss that you don't feel you can bear it, his love gives you a reason to carry on. When you're discouraged, he encourages you to look to him, for he has a plan for you and he will bring you safely home with joy. When you're tempted by another lover who would steal your heart and your affections away from him, something the rest of the world proclaims is really good and you should consider, he will not abandon you. He will uh, remain faithful even when his people are not. When you could not love him, he gave you his spirit to teach you how to love. When you wouldn't let yourself receive love, he was relentless in pursuing you. When you were afraid to be loved, afraid to let him into your life, he gave you peace. When you were a foolish child, he had his eye on you. He's kept you alive to this day for his purposes. When you made poor choices, he supplied new wisdom. When you sinned, he paid for that sin with his blood. When Satan wanted to attack and ruin you, he protected you. When you were ignorant of all his benefits and neglected worshiping him and gave your heart to busyness and drew you away from him, he sought you out. For he knew that you would not be satisfied with anything like you can be satisfied in him. And again, I remind you, he makes you holy so that he can delight in you. When you were proud because he loved you, he humbled you. When you lied, he convicted you of truth because of his love for you. When you showed hatred, he rescued you. When you refused to forgive, he broke your heart. When you would have run out of food, he provided for you. A thousand times when you com could have committed terrible sins, he turned you away from committing them. When you were lost, he found you. When you tried to be self-sufficient, he made you weak so you would turn back to him and find strength. When you were hopelessly blinded by sin, he gave you sight. When you didn't know him, he sent his word. When you had no faith to believe, he supplied it. When you didn't know what to pray, his spirit interceded for you. When you were a nobody, he made you a royal priest who fellowships with the God of the universe. When the best you could do meant nothing in light of eternity, he gave you work to do as his representative that has eternal significance. When you were bitter, he cleansed you and released you. When you were afraid to obey, he gave you courage. He gained the idea that this baptism, which signifies and seals to us the love of God, should be the key to our understanding of our identity, who we are. It's a hallmark, a symbol of his love, that he washed away our sins and removed everything that would keep us from him. May our Lord teach us to love. Well, I don't know how I'm going to do trying to sing a psalm because of this tickle that is um, just one step away from making me break out and coughing. So I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't work, and I'm sure I sound kind of flat and nasal-like because of the having had COVID last week. So if you want to turn it off now, you can. But um, Psalm 71, verses 14 through 21, I thought fit well with what we've just been talking about. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts 
and of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me, until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. Well, thank you for putting up with me as I stumbled around. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Teach us to cherish you and to find our baptism as precious. May we not take it lightly. May we walk around bearing with dignity the identity that we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit's work in us, and we have been cleansed. So, Lord, make us holy. Teach us how to love you as we should and to love each other. And, Lord, in behalf of uh, myself and Nancy, I want to give you thanks for uh, healing us so rapidly from covid and I know there's plenty in our community who are really struggling. So, Lord, I'm sure that as my brothers and sisters watch this, they have some names on their hearts of people who have COVID. I pray that you would hear our prayers and that you would rescue them. Please do away with COVID. Lord Jesus, make us holy that you may delight in us. Thank you again for um, your ownership over us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and good night.